everybody. I'm, uh, I apologize for not being able to be there uh, with you in person. And I'm actually uh, speaking from uh, Langkawi Island. And um, I still hope uh, that uh, I'll be able to present to you uh, this presentation. And uh, hopefully this will be of, great, of some benefit uh, as we come to uh, emergency radiation management. So, radioactive emergency management. We are actually dealing with uh, radioactive materials and um, uh, it may be found in industries, it may be found uh, in the war, but in any case, if you're working in the emergency department, one way or another, we need to be prepared. Prepare for any eventualities and possibilities. We follow uh, the philosophy from the arts of war by Admiral Sun Tzu. Admiral Sun Tzu was an old was, a, was an admiral uh, in old China and uh, according to him we must not think whether or not the enemy is coming we must uh, think that the enemy is coming and therefore we should be prepared and the same thing it, uh, this uh, 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 we would apply the same thing for radiation for that matter and um, if we go back to history the atomic bomb was dropped in the city of Hiroshima during the World War II. During that time, uh, there was the B-29 plane called Enola Gay. This is the plane and it carried uh, the bomb and uh, unleashed it from the sky and 70,000 people died instantly. And following that, another about 150,000 people died from the effects of the radiation from the burn, uh, from the trauma and uh, from other injuries associated with uh, this nu powerful nuclear bomb. You can see this is the city before the bombing and the city uh, after the bombing is, is just like this. Everything was cleared away in an instant. You can actually gauge how powerful this bomb uh, was. Three days later, um, Another bomb was scheduled to be dropped from the city of Nagasaki and before that, thousands of leaflets were dropped from the skies for the people of Nagasaki to take shelter and it was a warning that if the Japanese did not stop the world war, uh, they would actually be uh, suffering from another nuclear bomb attack. And uh, true to their words, uh, another plane called uh, Boxcar dropped another bomb and this time the, the bomb was called the Fat Man uh, and uh, this uh, massive uh, nuclear bomb literally destroyed the city. So uh, if you were to look at the city how it was like before the bombing and after it looks uh, like this. So it's a terrible bomb and uh, we um, Actually, uh, we saw in history how much the people suffered. One, from the instant effect of the bombing that caused uh, burns, that caused trauma, and then it also caused, uh, uh, there was a radiation effect that affected uh, multiple systems. These are some photos of the uh, atomic bomb victims during the World War then. There is this uh, thing called combined radiation injury and um, the combined radiation injury refers to the thermal uh, injury uh, in which the massive heat caused burns, mechanical combined radiation injury in which there was external and internal irradiation with a wound or fracture or hemorrhage and chemical whereby there was a chemical burn or chemical uh, intoxication. All this in combination caused such an horrendous effect for the people who suffered uh, from the uh, nuclear bomb attack in Japan during that time. Now, um, apart from that, uh, in a few years back, there was an earthquake uh, off the north uh, east of Japan and uh, the earthquake actually caused tsunami. The tsunami uh, reached the shores of Japan and uh, this was the tsunami then. And you could see it's quite terrible um, and this tsunami hit nuclear reactor in Fukushima. The nuclear reactor uh, suffered a lot of damage. Um, in this tsunami about uh, almost 19,000 people died and the Fukushima 1 nuclear power plant was affected. There was a nuclear meltdown uh, then 
and this caused a lot of a uh, tragedy. Now we look at effects of radiation exposure. For if you uh, exposed to radiation, any material that uh, is radioactive, you may have either deterministic effect or stochastic effect. For deterministic effect, this is something that has a threshold. It depends um, a radiation dose which is above this uh, threshold and it can cause cataracts, erythema, infertility. But uh, for stochastic effect, there is uh, no threshold. It can cause cancer or genetic uh, modification. So uh, whatever effect that one may get may be in this form in terms of a biological effect from radiation. These are long-term effects. But uh, before we got to this kind of long-term effect, we also have an acute effect and we call it acute radiation syndrome. It may affect a uh, patient in the, f in the sense that it can cause underlying cellular radiation effect, which can cause mitotic inhibition, cell killing, organ malfunction, vascular reaction, and uh, the clinical manifestation would depend on the effect on hematological, gastrointestinal, neurovascular, as well as a pulmonary um, system. So uh, one may get bleeding, uh, one may get low uh, blood levels, one may get nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and uh, one uh, may get seizure, and one uh, also uh, may suffer uh, from breathing problems. Now, does uh, Malaysia um, experience uh, any radiation injury? Um, and even we ask this question, is Malaysia even at risk? Now, we do have a small nuclear reactor in Bangi, Malaysia, which uh, is only one megawatt. A typical large nuclear reactor would have a, a capacity between 100 to 200 megawatts. Nevertheless, we have nuclear powered ships plying Straits of Malacca, and these powered ships have easily has a capacity of about 100 megawatt, which is uh, equivalent to a large nuclear reactor. We have nuclear reactors in neighboring countries, and radioactive materials are used in the industry. We have cobalt-60, for example, iodine-131 used in hospitals, and already, actually, there are reported cases uh, in Malaysia. Uh, uh, we did have uh, patients um, suffering from uh, acute radiation injury from iridium-192, and also another one, uh, a patient died uh, after being given iodine-131 uh, therapy. So I will delve into these uh, examples of cases so that we would understand. Uh, we did have some drills on radiation incidents. For example, uh, you can see that there's a nuclear sign there whereby there was a dirty bomb here and the Hazmat team from Fire and Rescue would come and set up their decontamination station. And uh, there would be a collaboration with the uh, Atomic Energy, Energy Licensing Board uh, which is the board responsible for the control of the radioactive materials in Malaysia. So there was a need to survey the patients, uh, if they, whether they are merely exposed or uh, if they, actually, they are actually contaminated. When we say exposed, means, it means that uh, the material is not in the patient. But when we say it's, uh, pa it's uh, a patient is contaminated, that means the material is with the patient. I'll show you a case of a patient who was exposed to iridium-192 from industrial accident whereby uh, there was a broken latch that uh, caused him to be exposed to the radioactive material. And he came in uh, and he had exfoliation over the hands and this is during observation in the ward. You could see it starts to form uh, erythema and subsequently blisters and the skin exfoliates. It's like a um, patient having a burn effect but there was uh, no fire. The patient was admitted to the ward and the levels of the white cell was observed as well as the thyroid uh, hormone levels and discharge after it was uh, normal. For contaminated patients, uh, I, we had a case of a 63 years old Malay gentleman who had an anterior neck swelling for 6 years and he actually had right follicular thyroid carcinoma. 
uh, thoracotomy was done and patient actually came for radio iodine ablation therapy with iodine 131 uh, and patient was given uh, that therapy uh, at the dose of uh, 30 millicurie unfortunately patient died on the first night after being given dose iodine so the iodine the radioactive iodine was in the patient's uh, thyroid and uh, this means the patient was contaminated patient didn't die from uh, this therapy but patient died from sepsis actually in normal practice such patient would be uh, admitted to iodine ward for three days after which the half life of the iodine would have come down uh, and patient would be discharged so to uh, handle this situation emergency physician and health physicists was uh, were called in and we identified some issues first the body was contaminated number two the family wants to have the body buried within 24 hours and if you observe the uh, what was needed um, the, before patient would be buried would be uh, a body cleansing and wrapping whereby uh, uh, the body would be cleansed and then the, uh, it will be wrapped with white cloth and the family insists on bringing back the body to their house in Baling Kedah which was about 400 kilometers away now this would pose a lot of radi radiation uh, doses uh, to people who handle this body along the way. If you look at the process of burial for Muslims, uh, first they did the body cleansing and the, uh, wrapping the white cloth, uh, and then patient will be transported on the hears, and then patient will be brought uh, to the mosque, and there will be prayers, and then patient will be taken to the graveyard, and uh, there will be people who are actually bringing in the patient to the graveyard, lowering the body to the graveyard. And you could imagine all these people uh, could be exposed to uh, radiation doses and they too would get effects of uh, radiation. So now we sat down and we tried to think what would be the best. Should we leave the body for three days and come and get the body back? Or was there uh, any um, alternative so that we could pacify uh, the family member? Now, uh, we sat down, that was uh, that night, uh, the health physicist and me, and we started to, uh, thought, to think what would be a, a good solution to such a case. Um, we uh, thought and uh, we used the principles of uh, distance, time and shield, the DTS uh, principle for safety radiation. Now, we could actually safely handle a patient who uh, was uh, who who is contaminated? If we know the safe distance and stay away from do that distance, or we limit the time of our the radiation exposure so that it doesn't exceed the allowed um, radiation dose uh, per year, or we use shield such as a plumber. But uh, a shield, actually, we're talking about needing a plumbum shield of about uh, 12 centimeter block to actually reduce as much as 50% uh, from uh, such rays. Uh, we're talking about gamma rays usually whereby it has a high penetration uh, capability. Now um, when we uh, talk about it we thought the best is that because we had to be close to the patient uh, we would actually measure and find out what's the safe distance uh, and what's the safe time allowed for us to be with the patient and forget about the shield because uh, uh, it will slow us down and um, what is more important is that we could safely handle the patient with the less uh, allowed radiation dose uh, for the year. Now um, we know that um, actually every one of us uh, uh, can take radiation safely that's why uh, we can uh, go through CT scans, we can go through x-rays. So uh, what we recommend is that we follow uh, the MOSTI recommendation whereby actually we can take uh, uh, radiation as much as 50 mSv per year but for radiation workers uh, we limit it to less than 20 mSv per year but for the public we limit it to less than one millisievert per year. Now, based on this calculation, we could strategize. For example, in this case, we want the people to uh, do all this body cleansing and also the wrapping of the uh, body. We could actually limit uh, based on uh, what's the radiation uh, rate that we measure through the survey meter, and uh, we uh, lay out the strategy. 
Now, we laid out the strategy and um, we explained to the family members uh, because we knew how much uh, radiation uh, that we could actually allow for uh, the people to handle the body. What we did was that um, we isolate the body, we uh, actually used a survey meter uh, and we know what's the safe distance. The safe distance was 2 meters and the radiation uh, rate we knew we could limit it to how many minutes. Now we give a personal protective equipment which is just a normal nursing barrier um, uh, um, dressing for these people from the religious council. They came to the ward and then they uh, performed this body cleansing and we gave them the time limit. Uh, so in about um, 10 minutes they were able to actually complete the body cleansing and then uh, wrap uh, the, uh, the white cloth and perform uh, the prayer and patient was uh, moved uh, to a uh, hears. Now uh, we had a strategy, we actually used the um, military ambulance which is a long wheelbase but we put the head um, to, close to the ambulance door so that the distance between the driver and the thyroid is more than 2 meters. That will be uh, safe for the driver to drive him back to a baling. Uh, only some mud rampits will be actually affected if they actually ride the motorcycle close to the ambulance door but they will usually die from a motor vehicle accident anyway so not worried about that. Now um, we got the uh, families briefed to prepare the burial ground uh, early and we were able to actually handle it and make sure that the body was uh, buried uh, quickly. Now we know that when you are buried you are six feet under and six feet is about uh, two meters and that's quite safe. Now another case of radioactive storm, a 24 years old Malay lady uh, came in, coming in with a sign symptom of hyperthyroidism and she just had a radioablative iodine therapy, the same therapy like that, uh, that gentleman and uh, he developed this uh, symptom one day after he was sent home for home quarantine. Nowadays, with a dose less than 30 millicurie, patients are allowed to self-quarantine and not to be in contact with family member or friends for uh, one week. But after one day, he developed these signs and symptoms and he, she had to be brought to our emergency department. Of course, our emergency staff would be at risk of um, being uh, exposed to radiation because she is radioactive. So again, uh, what we did was that we isolate the patient and we examine the patient uh, and she got um, high, actually she got thyroid storm because the, the Bush and Watowski score for this patient was actually 55. If it is anything more than 45, it is high likely that patient will be having thyroid storm. So we start the treatment for thyroid storm uh, in this patient but we also observe safety so that our staff would not be affected from the radiation that this uh, patient has. Uh, following the radio iodine ablation uh, therapy. Uh, so this was the patient. The picture was uh, deliberately made blurred so you can't see the patient face but uh, we surveyed uh, the patient and um, we actually started the treatment for thyroid storm in the form of cabimazole, iodine, propanolol and hydrocortisone and we call in medical physicists and nuclear physicists and we uh, examined uh, the radiation rate was 0.02 mSv per hour and safe distance was at 2 meters and with calculation of a, a limit, limit of 1 mSv per year uh, we calculated that they can, one can have a close contact with this patient for as long as 50 hours. Subsequently, patient was admitted to isolation ward and um, each nurse uh, would be given a limit contact time of 50 hours and we advise uh, those who are pregnant not to actually handle this patient. So uh, we, uh, with the health physicists at the hospital, the, you will have one uh, health physicist minimum if your hospital has radioactive material. So if you have this situation, you could just contact them. They can help you to survey uh, how the safe distance and what's the uh, dose rate for you not to have exceeding the radiation dose uh, allowed. So this patient uh, was stable throughout the stay, recovered from the thyroid storm. 
and she was actually discharged six days later. So management of a patient with a radiation uh, emergency. Now, who shall manage? We need emergency physicians, we need internists, hematologists, infectious disease specialists, oncologists, surgeons, anesthesiologists, psychologists, and most importantly, medical and health physicists. Because uh, we need to handle them from the early phase to the ward management and even when there was a need for uh, operation. So all these people need to come in. And this is actually a multidisciplinary approach. And as uh, we approach the patient, we always observe the DTS principle of the safe distance of the uh, time limit allowed so that we do not exceed that time limit and uh, also if there is an appropriate shield. Uh, we need to handle this patient from the incident side and we need to do triage, a medical triage, um, but we also need to do a, a radiological triage, a radiation triage, whereby to know who are exposed and who are not. Those who are merely exposed can does not need isolation, those who are contaminated would need isolation. So we uh, actually perform the usual uh, first action, standard emergency medical procedures like airway, breathing, circulation, uh, and uh, we may perform a decontamination after stabilization if need be. Now, as I said earlier, if patients only had exposure, uh, then uh, they do not need to be isolated. Those patients uh, with uh, trauma and burns and without radiation injury uh, uh, may be referred to specialized treatment centers according to their injuries. Those who probably suffered from radiation injury from signs and symptoms may be referred to treatment centers and can be evaluated and uh, assessed if there was uh, any bone marrow uh, failure because the radiation actually could suppress the bone marrow. Uh, now, if patient comes to uh, your facility, we need to prepare the facility. We need to cover uh, the, your uh, decon room with uh, plastic or a Chinese paper uh, uh, so that no material would be actually um, uh, can be collected. If there is any radioactive material, it can be collected. And then the, we need to rope in the health physicist to help us to do the survey. Uh, we can use decontaminating agents, but soap and water would be alright. But if you want, you can soap, use other agents like detergents, like even Clorox um, to clean the area. Usually what we do is just uh, to actually dilute the area, not the whole thing, but only the area whereby there was contamination. For example, only that area of the skin that has contamination, we would actually um, uh, irrigate that area. For radionuclide inhalation, we can irrigate the nose, mouth, pharynx. There's no effective medical means to enhance lung clearance, but bronchopulmonary lavage uh, may be considered for major lung uh, leaf high hazard lung contamination. For ingestion, if any radioactive material ingested, we have to irrigate the nose, the mouth, and the pharynx. We may try to remove the gastric content if patients ar arrive early, or give purgatives like uh, magnesium sulfate uh, so that patient will vomit out, uh, or give chemical antidote for blocking, diluting, or chelating. Unfortunately, we do not have an uh, antidote for radiation uh, readily. Some may have, but I asked the pharmacy, we do not have um, it available readily. For contaminated wound, we would irrigate the wound with saline and water, um, and uh, we would continue to irrigate until the radiation level is zero or constant as much as possible. And uh, treat the wound as uh, usual. The uh, If there was uh, there is internal contamination, we would try to um, uh, hasten the excretion. Uh, we may use blocking and diluting agents when appropriate. We may use uh, mobilizing uh, agents or chelating agents uh, if available. Now, patient may suffer pancytopenia from the bone marrow suppression, so we need to isolate the patient uh, and uh, to avoid patient from uh, sustaining secondary bacterial um, infection, for example, for which patient may need uh, antibiotics. So from here, you can see that there were a lot of considerations um, that uh, you have to think for the patient. And the approach of management is actually um, uh, very much involving uh, people from other uh, disciplines and specialties. So the steps in clinical care of local radiation injury um, you need uh, to take the history and physical examination, take a serial blood count, 
uh, do a chromosome analysis for which we can send blood uh, to uh, MR, uh, IMR or ALB for uh, DNA study. We need to reenact the accident, do frequent color photograph, baseline extremity x-ray, ophthalmologic slit lamp examination, sperm count and even surgical consult. So all this may be required um, as we uh, actually manage the patient because from the very beginning we, uh, this patient may uh, we could record how much uh, the patient uh, suffers in terms of bone marrow uh, suppression and up to the uh, other effects such as um, uh, cataracts and infertility uh, and, and, and such things. Now we also need to uh, care about psychological support, they would be worried. Uh, we actually treat them symptomatically most of the time and we try to prevent infection and hemorrhage. Uh, we may give uh, antibiotics, we may give uh, blood products uh, for this. We need to maintain hydration and nutrition, give fluids, supportive management. In some cases, we have to encourage cell renewal by giving growth factors and even stem cells. And we need also to control inflammatory response. Uh, we need to give uh, supportive treatment in the form of analgesics, antiprotics, anti-inflammatories, antibiotics, even skin growth factors if needed, synthetic occlusive dressings, and even in some cases surgical intervention by uh, doing debridement, excision, grafting, and uh, even amputation. Handle the patient's psychological uh, uh, state. We need someone who's knowledgeable about uh, radiation, but able to counsel the patient as to the uh, action of plan. Uh, and that is really, really uh, uh, useful. Now, we try to do this uh, training by using toys, and uh, it seems that uh, we can actually uh, improve by making our uh, doctors play and we found that there was a good increase of knowledge. So there are multiple ways for us to improve understanding and um, of radiation uh, management. But in summary, uh, we need uh, an understanding and to actually be prepared for uh, radiation safety. Uh, we need uh, to learn from experiences, especially those with real cases and, and the drills are the best teachers and even the, the games and simulations. We need to have a common system for preparation. So with that, thank you.